Hi everyone, this is Lauren Baker, founder of Search Engine Journal, and thank you for coming to today's SCJ Marketing Think Tank webinar. Um, with me, I have uh, Idan Segal from Wix. Give you a second to say hi real quick, Idan. Hey Lauren, thanks for having me today. Absolutely. Would you mind uh, uh, moving up one slide? Yep, sure. Great. Uh, so today, um, Idan from our partner Wix is going to be uh, doing a presentation on how to evolve your client's content strategy with ever-changing algorithms. Before he gets started and to give some of the folks that are a little bit late uh, logging on a chance to do so, I'm going to go ahead and uh, go over some housekeeping. Uh, first and foremost, our official hashtag is S hashtag SCJ Think Tank. You'll see that at the bottom of the presentation. Um, and then you'll also see Idan's handle. If uh, you have any questions or if you want to share some uh, screen caps on Twitter, uh, please do so. Feel free to tag us and uh, let your friends know what they're missing out on. Um, you're more than welcome to uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, also, our presentation today will last about 45 minutes. After the main presentation is over, we'll be doing a Q&A session. So please, um, while Idan is uh, presenting, go ahead and ask some questions within our question box here on the GoToWebinar control panel. I'll then be consolidating those questions and asking them live during the Q&A session afterwards. But as they come up and as they pop up in your head, please go ahead and uh, pop them in. Uh, also, um, we'll be having a poll uh, later today in the presentation. So when I launch the poll, uh, we usually give you about uh, 30 seconds or so to vote. We try to get about 80% of you voting, so I'm going to put that in your heads right now. Um, uh, vote when we launch that poll, and we'll get great information back for Idan and for the rest of his presentation. And uh, then afterwards, we'll be launching a quick survey. So that's it. That's everything for now on the housekeeping side of things. I'm going to hand things off to you, Idan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's really nice participating in an event that isn't getting canceled because of the coronavirus. Um, so, yes, I'll start. Uh, okay. My name is Idan Segal. I'm the organic growth lead here in Wix.com. That basically says that I'm managing the SEO team and the blogs team and basically every other content marketing initiative that can bring us traffic. Uh, I want to talk a bit about my previous life. Basically, all my life, I'm working with content. Uh, before joining the Wix marketing team back in 2014, I was a sport journalist. I did it for about eight years. I covered World Cups. I've been in Brazil, European Championships. I've been in France and even the London Olympics in 2012. And I must tell you that I see so many similarities between sports and SEO. Uh, yeah, it can be funny, but I see it. Uh, they are both dynamic. They are ever changing. There's always clear winners and losers. But you also have the next game to recover. Um, in my opinion, you know, like you have the NBA and NFL big uh, franchises, also in SEO, it's very clear who are the smart organizations, who knows how to plan ahead, who knows how to execute a strategy, who knows how to be efficient, who knows to pivot when they meet adversity. And this is what I'm always trying to explain my, my peers and my clients is that if SEO is the right channel for their business, it's the holy grail. But also that SEO alone is not enough. I'm really sorry about the sport reference, but I, I really can't help it. It's a problem. Uh, SEO for me, it's like a good quarterback. He needs a strong offensive line in order for him to shine. That's simple. The same way it goes with clients. They must give you the right tools to implement your strategy. Dev, for example, this is always a pain. And in general, I believe that SEO alone just won't do it. There's no magic. You must support SEO with smart social activity, with great performance, with PPC, with email marketing, with Killer UX and other supporting channels. You won't hear me saying that SEO is rocket science, far from that. But it is about the strategy, it is about the work you put in, it is about the small details, about planning ahead, about embracing hard work. Uh, that's it, that's my uh, <laughs> preview. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cover uh, in this presentation many things, many interesting things in my opinion. Uh, I'm going to talk about intent. I'm going to talk about how to utilize the SERP to your advantage. I'm going to talk about the buzzword that we can't live without here in SEO, about BERT, about EAT. I'm going to talk about blog strategy, and I'm going to talk about localization. 
but for me in the end all the things that i just mentioned it's about killer content it's about content which really brings value for users so let's start intent and why it will still be your focus in 2020 so I want to start with intent because I really feel that this is the world that I'm keep saying on and on and on. And honestly, I don't see it changing in 2020. I really like this quote from Jeff Bezos. He wrote it to these Amazon shareholders back in 2017. And he said, customers are divinely discontent. Their expectations are never static. They go up. Yesterday's wow quickly becomes today's ordinary. He also said that this is completely natural. He says that uh, this is human nature, that uh, that's our species, that we didn't ascend from the prehistoric man by being satisfied. Humans did it with endless appetite for finding a better way. And I think that part of our job today is educating our clients. It will definitely be worth your time. I'm not saying that we can solve this issue. Clients are tough and they will be tough. But in our niche, in SEO, we can try to educate them a bit about SEO, even, even a bit. It will definitely save a lot of time. It will definitely save a lot of pain from you and from your team. I really think that uh, if your clients will understand the complexity of the machine that we are facing, this ever-changing algorithm that makes their life so simple and our life so complex, they will maybe, maybe I must say, give you the tools that you need to succeed. This is why it's worth your time and you should address it. And sometimes, in my opinion, even in the kickoff meetings. Well. Ah, by the way, something that I must say that even when you're trying to educate them, they need to understand that you know your business. They need to know that you are 100% aligned with their business goals and objective. They need to know that you know what you're talking about. Now let's move to query types. Now you see here on the screen the, the most uh, basic uh, query types intent. There's the transactional, the informative, and the navigational. The do, the know, the go. Transactional is very simple. You buy something. Those are usually your money generating pages. The informational, it's the how-to, it's the where, it's the what keywords. Usually you see guides, blogs, resources, definitions. And in the navigational, I will touch real soon in my next slide. Um, another, I, I really, in many niches, uh, I think that I need to address like a sub-intent of informational. This is for me the comparison intent. Uh, in the past, I saw a lot of uh, keywords with like best or versus or review. Uh, that were ranking with uh, comparison results, usually in affiliate, because we live in a very heavy affiliate world. But in the last couple of years, we see them in every query. They became a very dominant person, and I think they, uh, they now deserve their own intent. Another thing, oh, of course, there's the local intent. That is something uh, that all of you know. Not all of you deal with that, but all of you know it. And another sub-intent for me is inspirational. Uh, for us, it works really good when we see the... Uh, keywords with examples, with ideas, with showcases, this is a very interesting intent. Now, when it becomes tricky, it becomes tri tricky when you have mixed helps. Why? For example, let's see this keyword. Uh, it runs a bit fast, but uh, you will handle it. Cloud storage. This is basically, you see here, a mixture of all intents. You see here uh, a lot of informative qu query uh, results, and you see a lot of transactional results. In the end, I think, by the way, in some cases, you even you will see a lot of uh, local results. In this case, it's not happened because cloud storage is way, way too big. I think when we're talking about software and online products, they tend to be much more complex and therefore they are mixed. If we will talk about duct tape or we will talk about toilet paper, that now it's a very big thing because of all this coronavirus mess, you will see much less because the the... The client is in a very simple decision-making phase, and Google understands that he needs to show him transactional uh, results, product results. Sometimes, by the way, you will even see that different verbs behave different on the SERP. You will see that verbs like buy, like make, like create, like build, like start, generates different SERPs. That's really fascinating. Another uh, example is ticketing system. Ticketing system here, you can see, again, it's fast, so I will give you the, I will do spoiler. You have five product results and you have four informative uh, uh, results. This is a classical uh, mixed cell. I must say a tip, uh, in my opinion, if you will be able to understand where to identify where queries have only the buy intent and not the mixed, it will really help you prioritize better. I'm not saying not to tackle and not to target the mixed steps, but I do think that when you see the queries that generates only by 
results, the ROI is much more steady and we are here about revenues. So things to remember. I think that above everything, what we need to ask ourselves is the right questions. We need, when we're talking about intent, we need to ask, what are the goals of my audience? We need to ask, what tasks do they want to accomplish? Why would they want this content? In what stage of the funnel are they in? And how does it relate to other topics my audience care about? I think that uh, in the end of the day, you, you know your niches and your client niches uh, better than everyone. You need to do proper research, you need to do a thorough research, and you need to decide whether you go for informative, whether you go to transactional, uh, informational, or even the ones that I said, inspirational and uh, comparison. But in the end, after you choose something and it doesn't work, uh, you need to be fair uh, because sometimes we are failing and you need to admit and adjust. Another thing that's important to say is to double check. Now uh, we live in a world that you have like, three or four core updates everywhere and Google are kind enough to let us know in advance. And every core update holds surprises. I see it in many products, in many niches and so so of you. And I think that we need always to check and to make sure that uh, uh, things didn't change dramatically and don't fall in love with your theories because things change fast. Another thing, and it's about the navigational keywords that I said before, is about owning your queries. What do I mean? I think that we need to give users the journeys that they are looking for. What do I mean? Wix hosting. Wix hosting, it's a keyword that I discovered a few years ago that uh, it, there's a, a very high search volume. But for me, you know, I work in Wix and Wix is a product that gives you hosting is like kind of feature for us. It's so trivial. We give it, it's, it's something so basic for us that we give to our users that we didn't uh, make a fuss out of it. But for some users, a website starts from hosting. And then we created, a, we created a page that talks about Wix hosting. And suddenly we saw numbers go up and suddenly this page really fulfills the user need. It really answers, uh, answers something that is important to them. Another example that's worth mentioning uh, is promo codes. There are so many aggregator sites that create, uh, that have promo codes for all the companies and that's nice. But my question to you is why you don't own, own your queries? For example, Wix promo code. Why should I give this aggregator my traffic that then they will come there and they will say, oh, let's see their competitor. Maybe they have a cheaper coupon. No, I want to create my own page and I want people to choose the promo code for my property. And this is something that you really should uh, do and own your queries. Now, this is a presentation that really made a huge impact on me. This is uh, the legendary Will Reynolds from Sear Interactive. It was in MozCon in 2017. Uh, it was called I'd rather be tanked than ranked. For me, it really gave me an holistic approach about SEO, about content, about better understanding of, of, of our parts in the game as SEOs. And basically, this is a sentence that sticks with me. I don't want to call myself an SEO anymore. I feel more like a concierge of the web. When you're lost, we'll guide you to the best answer. In the end, this is what we're trying to say. We are all servants. And what we need to do is to solve problems. We need to bring great answers to people, even if it doesn't sit well with our funnels. We don't need to talk all the time about tofu and mofu and bofu. We need to go the extra mile and give our users a real solution to give the people what they want. But in the end of the day, we're a business and we like money and we like to do money for us and for our customers. So after you gave them the perfect answer, retarget them like crazy, but in a smart way. Now, my second part of the webinar is gonna be about how to use SEOPINs to improve your client strategy, how to utilize them in the best way. First of all, I wanna say that, you know, I have a lot of tools, I have a lot of subscriptions and I'm using many things, but for me, there's no better tool than live SEOP in Incognito. It's th there's nothing that teaches, teaches me more by just spending many hours on my SEOPs and trying to understand what happened, what changed, what happened to the layout. So the first thing that I recommend to do is to learn from your, from, your from your competition, sorry. Someone probably already nailed it before you. So you need to research your top results to, to see what ranks over there, what your competitors are doing, and you need to learn from them. If you dive into the top results and you will understand what's unique, you, what's unique over there, you can imitate it and you can get really good results. The next thing is to learn from core updates. Google works in a mysterious way and it changes often and you need to take insights from every update. We saw it in the medical update, we saw it in, in the your money, uh, your life keywords, 
we saw it here in Wix, for example, in the free keywords. We saw a lot of competitors that aren't really free and doesn't offer a really good free solution, and they really suffered afterwards. We also saw it in the diversity update, in the local update. There are many, many things to learn from core updates, and you need to learn from them. But, and this is important, don't get rushed decisions. Google is probably still testing, and please don't change your strategy upside down because you saw a change after like two days after a core update. Now, the next thing I'm gonna, I want to tackle is uh, to maximize the SERP. What do I mean? First of all, SERPs get much more local. In February 7, there was an unconfirmed algo change that uh, was very aggressive in the local results. For example, I saw in many of my keywords that has also local results, I saw um, in, the, in the keyword research tools like Ahrefs, for example, I saw a very big estimation of traffic that gets in. But when I checked it in the Google Search Console, there were discrepancies. I think that those keyword research tools are like using the scraper seat somewhere in the States, for example, and it shows me that I'm, I'm, I'm ranking number three. But when I'm going to a city like Boston, like Los Angeles, like New York, I see that I'm, I'm ranking in position seven, eight, because it's not only the local SERP above me, also part of the organic results are, localized, are local results. And this is something that can really damage your, uh, your estimations and can cost you money. The next thing is video carousel. This uh, SERP widget is really important. And I think that every time that you detect that there's a video carousel, that there's videos that Google ch uh, is choosing to show when you Google one of your queries, you need to initiate a video. This is something really important and you can do it first of all by yourself, you can initiate it. And if you don't have the resources, you can approach a third party. In the end of the day, if the video is about you, about your product, about your client, it will do the job. The next thing is affiliates. Uh, they are major players in the top SERPs. Uh, when I'm doing market share uh, researches, I always see uh, a lot of uh, affiliates players getting a vast majority of the market share and they are on the rise. So like I said before, this is not only the best, the versus, the review, the comparison, the plural keywords, they are everywhere. And if the affiliate in your field does not include you, you're doing something wrong. The next thing is site links. Site links, uh, you know, when you Google a non-branded query and you see your result with four site links below. For me, it's a hint. For me, you need to make sure that those pages are optimized. You need to make sure that those pages gives value. You need to make sure that those pages have the right internal linking to your money pages, to relevant pages. Those pages are really important and you need to use those hints. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is FAQ. Uh, the FAQ structure data is really popular recently. A lot of uh, products, a lot of sites are testing it. I must tell you that for me, it's really uh, inconclusive. In some niches, it works nice. In some niches, it works comsi uh, comsa. Uh, but I do think that there's something really nice because in the end, it shoves your competitors down. It gives you more real estate. And something else that I really recommend that I see a lot of uh, uh, websites are not doing it is to use the FAQs for internal linking and like I said before FAQs are not for everyone but I really recommend you to test this is something that I will always recommend to do test 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 now before I'm going to talk about deduplication I want to talk about rich results in general this is something that makes all of us freak out. And I think that, uh, to, you know, rich results like the top stories, the video carousel, the product widgets, the local pack, the people also ask, they basically change our world. Last week, I read in Mars an article from uh, Dr. Pete that he said that in, back in 2013, the average first organic results began at 375 pixels down the page and that the worst result, that back then it was the Disney stock, was less than 1,000 pixels down. Today, 2020, 17% of the first organic results are worse than 1,000 pixels. He even shows over there something that is really hilarious, that the word lollipop, that is also a song, is 3,000 pixels below. You have so many rich results until you get to the first result for lollipop. We just live in a different era, and it's a crazy era. So, deduplication. This is the recent development in SEO, and it was rolled out in, on January 22nd. And to those who landed from the moon, I will explain very shortly, Google just stopped showing double results. Meaning if you got the featured snippet, you stopped appearing also as one of the organic results. And this thing is very dramatic. And bosses and clients want to know what the recent change means for their business. Do they lo lose money? Do they gain money? And for me, the main question is, does featured snippet still worth the effort? For me, the answer is yes. 
Uh, Lauren, you want to take it now? Absolutely. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. Here you go. Just, just like Edam was saying, will you still go after feature snippets now that there's deduplication? Please select one of the following. Yes or no? Yes or no? So um, I'd also like to answer a couple of questions that came in. I uh, had some questions about whether or not this webinar was going to be available afterwards. The answer is yes. It will be available. We'll be sending it out um, to all registrants and attendees, as well as hosting it on our YouTube and doing a webinar recap. Um, and someone just asked me if we're recording them through their camera on their computer. No, we are not, just for clarification. So there's no recording of you, but we are recording uh, the webinar itself. Um, so uh, we've had 64%, 65% have answered. Uh, before I share the uh, results, I'd like to go ahead and ask those of you who have not voted yes or no to go ahead and do so now. Our goal is to get 80%. So I see uh, some of you, uh, it's, it's improving. So let me just do a countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. All right, final chance. I'm closing the poll <clears throat> and sharing the results. So 86% of you had, have said, uh, <clears throat> yes, you're still going to go after feature snippets. And 14% say no. Now that there's de deduplication, um, we're not going to go after feature snippets anymore. Any thoughts on that, Idan? Yes. For me, first of all, those 13 percent are uh, it's fascinating. I would want to sit with each and every one of them and want to understand why. Uh, but again, you know, it's SEO, and sometimes things that you see from here are different from things that you see from there. And maybe for their niche, uh, there are arguments that make sense. But I must say that for me, and you already know my answer for this poll. A featured snippet are still the thing that I'm going to chase, and I'm not. I don't see it changing in the near future. So I'll continue. Uh, I want to talk a bit about like here in weeks we checked our data, and we ran a small case study. It's not a big enough sample or time frame, but it's still something. So bear with me. We had two questions. The first one was the most obvious one. What was the effect of going from two properties on the SERP to one? meaning losing the double real estate, the double dipping. So how did we do it? We basically compared the difference of clicks and CTR of four weeks before and four weeks after the deduplication for keywords that we've constantly held the featured snippet for. The results uh, were very clear. The deduplication had a negative effect on our CTR. It was something around 4%. Uh, it's not that dramatic. I saw things that are much, much... Uh, more sharp. For example, even here in Search Engine Journal, I read a case study, and in Mars, over there, I saw around like 7%, 13% CTR drops. Basically, I really think that the days that we in SEO, we got 15% CTR way gone. Google is uh, now for users. It's not for SEOs anymore. Very sad. Um, but by the way, when we checked what happened to us in the opposite situation, where we jumped a position and gained from a competitor losing a double real estate, we saw an increase of 2% CTR. I really expected to see a, biggest, a bigger jump, but I have patience. I would wait. <laughs> the second question, position zero versus position one. Marie Haynes from uh, Marie Haynes Consultancy. I'm a keen admirer. She also won the uh, Wix SEO uh, competition recently. She tweeted back then after the deduplication rollout that non-SEO users are reporting confusion between featured snippet and ads that they don't know. They think the featured snippet is an ad. Is an ad. Very weird, but okay. So we checked if it's better to have a featured snippet, meaning rank on position one, or to rank second, the top organic results. Basically, we want to check do you should you should we opt out from featured snippets? How did we do it? Again, we compare the average CTR of keywords receiving the featured snippet versus keywords in position two since the deduplication. In other words, we compare the current effect of appearing only as a featured snippet versus the f the first organic results. Over there, uh, we tried to do it also with informative queries, but it was very tough and inconclusive because it, it's not, uh, we didn't have enough data. But for product pages, having the featured snippet was still way, way more valuable than ranking second. The CTRs were crazy, significantly higher. It was something on average of 60% higher, 16% higher. 
that's uh, really, really crazy. So about my thoughts about featured snippet, you know, I'm, I'm writing about voice search. Voice search is still the direction for Google, right? You know, I think today I read on Mars that 14% uh, of the searches include a featured snippet today. It's just too big to ignore. And if we believe that Google counts on voice search and I'm counting on that, I think that uh, featured snippets are not going anywhere and I'm going to optimize for it. But you also have alternatives. There's the new uh, max character tag and you can try to opt out from featured snippet or to try to uh, use the max character tag that limits you to 50 characters. And basically you're trimming your uh, featured snippet and you're trying to make it a bit more enticing in order for the users not to know the answer and that they will want to click. Is this the right thing to do? I think probably not because I think that if you trim your result, your result becomes less quality. And if it's less quality and there's high competition, Google will choose, will probably choose someone else. But again, I'm, I'm really in favor of testing and I really urge you to test. Another very small thing that we saw in our test and I wanna, I wanna raise is about the people also ask boxes. Um, we saw that when you have a featured snippet that the people also ask box comes just right after him, you see a, a huge decrease in CTR, meaning the people also ask really hurts the featured snippet when he comes just after it. Now, before I'm gonna talk about the SERP free cards, as I like to call it, I wanna say that keyword research alone is just not enough. Most of you already know it, but for those who don't, I really think that today's game is about topic clusters. It's about adding layers of content that will help us understand the bigger picture. What's relevant to what? Basically, we are trying to predict what the search engine expects to see. And in the end, people also ask boxes and they auto suggest and the related searches that you see in the SERP, it's like live uh, free in, uh, intelligence that you get from Google. They are clues. I think, by the way, I read something really interesting. I think it was yesterday or two days ago um, that people tweeted that they saw a large drop in the people also ask boxes. They showed a drop of something between 6% to 12%. We saw it, by the way, only in very specific niches, but it's something that uh, definitely worth monitoring. In the end, remember that Google is probably testing, so don't go nuts. But I think the most crucial point here is that if you Google something, like what is a webinar, and you see in the people also ask questions like those four, you need to answer those questions. You need to use the auto suggest. You need to use the related searches. Those are hints. There's a very strong correlation between the query to those questions. So please, please use it. Um, next, I want to talk about tools. You have many tools that can help you with that, that will make your life much more efficient. I really like the people, uh, uh, the Keywords Everywhere extension. You can really, it scrapes the people also ask boxes, it scrapes the related keywords, and like with a simple click of a button, you export it to CSV, and you start collecting more and more data. If this is, doesn't work well for you, you can try a very catchy name, extract people also search phrases in Google, also works amazing. Uh, another thing that you can do, there are a lot of free tools and pay tools. For example, Answer the Public, they have a free and a paid model, but uh, the free one works really good for me in many cases, and it helps me like to draw a skeleton of my content, to understand all the questions that I need to answer. Another thing that I'm using as is free, it's a bit different angle, uh, is the Engram Analyzer and Word Cloud Generator. Like, let's talk about Word Cloud. It's like the most classical thing. If you will go to your top queries and you will start uh, throwing your competitor content into word clouds, you will see a lot of words that are jumping out of, on you. And you see words that you will say, wow, they're, they're repeating in so many times. It's probably important if Google evaluates this page so highly. So this is another tool that is very, very simple that you should use. From the pay tools, uh, something that really helps me is the Ahrefs questions feature. And another one is SEMrush, the topic research you have on the left side in the upper bar, you have a question tab, and this is something that can really help you, but there are other features over there with the topic research that you can really use. Now, you need to know your client's clients. How can you do it? For example, for me, I think that the search term report, it's pure gold. You need to learn from your PPC data. It's like playing poker when you already know the cards. An SEO that does not use the search term report, in my opinion, just is not doing his job. 
it can give you a lot of fresh takes about your priorities. It can show you some uh, new blue ocean to cover. It can show untapped topics. It can show you how to use a better wording. You can discover that uh, a keyword that is much, much lower volume converts much better. And maybe it won't change your mind completely, but it will change your priorities. You, will, you won't neglect this, neglect this keyword anymore. And this is something uh, really important that will help you optimize for conversions. The next thing is about talking with your clients' customers. Nothing beats a conversation. I really, really believe in it. I'm very lucky to work in a product company that is really good in that, and we really care about our users. And I think that there's nothing more helpful and more insightful that teaches you about the real pains uh, by doing, in our case, product usability test, but also to conduct interviews, to go into communities, I'm, I'm really spending a lot of time reading Facebook groups and understanding uh, what people are suffering from, what they like, because it really helps me with covering the content. The next thing, ORM, online reputation management. I think that seeing the dirt that is written about your brand and address it is crucial. You, need, you can use search operators for the site and add, uh, add words like review, uh, fraud, scam, Worst, I hope that your clients will be in a better uh, situation than this, but you can use those words and see what comes up. I think that it will give you a, a peek under the hood of the dirt and it will really help you to tackle those topics or to go around them smartly. The last thing is support. If you have a client that has support, I think you can find gold over them. You can really own the problems. We are very lucky here in Wix to have this asset. And as a product company, we understand the urgency. We learn from it. We even prioritize features according to it. And we really understand the problems and what bothers our clients. And we're working really hard to solve it. Now, uh, you can't uh, have a webinar about SEO and not talk about BERT and EAT apparently. This is the era of buzzwords. This is how I call this chapter, but I really prefer to tackle this topic in a different way. It's about your content must keep up the pace in this crazy machine learning, NLP, AI world. Things are just became hectic and we need to step up and evolve. So BERT. BERT is without a doubt the biggest development in, in search at least since rank rain was out five years ago and it's basically about google got it just got much better in understanding language bert helps machines understand nuances it helps them with context with surrounding text cohesion and in other words to put it very simply it's about understanding the way words fit together with structure and meaning I really think that uh, looking at it and look how things change, it's, uh, it's really fascinating because a single word today can change the whole intent of a conversational query. And with BERT become so much better in stop words, words like about, because, and, and, but, can, cannot, own, do, if, I can go on and on, I will stop now. Um, with BERT being better with relations between the different sentences, about BERT having the ability to really get words and multiple meanings. This is a word that's really tough for me in English, but I will try. Polysemous words. You see more and more of them, and BERT is just a machine that gave Google the ability to cope with those words. So, people say that you can't optimize for BERT, and I, I can agree, I can agree. You can't optimize for it, but you can and you must change your client mindset. Again, I'm going back to educating your clients. They probably don't care about words like NLP and machine learning, but if you will work on your pitch, so they will really understand the complexity and the opportunity that BERT brings and, and the focus that they need to, to put on content, maybe they will be convinced. You know, in the end, people love to feel like early adapters. It's a lot about you and you have the ability to change it. Sometimes, again, like Beza says, clients can be tough. The next thing is about content and the site structure. For me, they are royalty. It's a new era of content understanding and basically what BERT did, it, Google basically learned how to scale. And now we, uh, the poor SEO people, we just need to keep up the pace. The last thing is that Google understands content better and how I see it, Google also understands links better. Why? 
if Google understands the page much, much better, he understands better the document, and he understands the links, and he understands the documents behind the links, so he probably values them a bit differently. And in my opinion, this is one of the reasons that we see such heavy fluctuation in uh, rankings recently, and I think that we will keep seeing it, and I think that if a page now is much more valuable in Google eyes, so also the links over there are more valuable, and it's kind of changing the equation. Again, this is my assumption, but I'm living in peace with it. Now, let's talk a bit about EAT, expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. This is basically the three foundations of great content. I really think that I can speak another hour only about EAT, uh, but for time reason, I just uh, strongly recommend you uh, to subscribe to Marie Haynes' newsletter. I, I mentioned her before, but I really think she's a very uh, good influencer. It's highly recommended. Also, she has a great podcast that I hear a lot, Search News You Can Use. And when talking about EAT, something that really jumped to my eyes is that EAT is mentioned 135 times on Google search quality guidelines, on the content rater guidelines. A few months ago, it was 186 times. If you don't understand how important it is and, and that you need to read it and that you need to make sure your team read it, I will show you a quote from Ben Gomez, Google Vice President of Search. Gomez said that you can view the rater guidelines as where we want the algorithm to go. It won't tell you how it ranks, but it fundamentally show you, shows you what the algo should do. So I really think that uh, there's a, a lot of uh, good hints and good lessons in the content rater guidelines. And I really think you should take a deep look if you didn't do it already. It's long, but fascinating. Now, how should you step up your content game in a belt and EAT? world so first thing first you need to find the right ingredients for the recipe like i said before keywords are not enough anymore you need to own the right topics what do i mean let's say i'm writing a guide about seo i must tick all the boxes all the relevant topics so if it's a guide about seo it won't be a complete guide unless i'm writing about on page optimization age ones off page indexing crawling, link building, outreach, intent, algo updates, the relevant tools, the strategies, uh, techniques, organic traffic versus paid, PPC, search console, analytics, uh, Google, Bing, Yandex, those things need to be covered in order for Google to understand that you did a good job, that you covered everything. Now, in order to uncover those topics, I really recommend you using the tools that I covered before uh, and answer all the relevant questions. This is the name of the game answer the right questions. Now, let's talk about uh, the second bullet, keep your internal linking relevant. I think about the content on the other side of the hyperlink, don't fluff link, basically create topic clusters with semantic relationship between the pages content. If you'll do it, it will signal Google that there's real depth in the content. Consider also uh, breaking the small topics into long tail guides and then link between them. You really need to think about topic clusters and you really need to imagine it and to think and to draw it from your researchers. This is something that uh, you will see results very fast. This is a, a really fascinating thing. Now, site structure. Site structure must make sense. Uh, this is something that after BERT I see, and again, this is about uh, BERT having the ability to scale. I think that using categories and subcategories smartly really helps and helps Google understand your site and your hierarchy, and it makes Google's life much easier. And if you make Google life much easier, like always, you will be rewarded. The next thing is expertise. Again, EAT is, that's the E. It will be valued even more. Uh, that's clear in my opinion, because if an NLP expert will write a text about BERT, it will be valued much more than Idan Segal text. Um, that's really simple. The next thing is content for the whole domain matters. What do I mean? Co-occurrence is an indicator for semantic proximity. Basically, Google understands your site as a whole. It will be hard and maybe even impossible to conquer a new niche if there's no mention of it in your whole domain, if this is not related to your core. Basically, I don't think that here in Wix we can start ranking for wedding dresses, even if, even if we try real hard, because this is not what we do. This is not the topics that we own. The next thing is neutral help. 
If you can't do it in-house, I really think that you need to consider hiring a third-party service to review your content and users and user experience. You need to beef up your content, you need to proofread it, and you need to make sure that your content is the best possible. I can't emphasize it enough. Do whatever it takes to make your, to make your content great. Here I'm talking again about uh, online reputation management issues because I do think that you need to identify them, identify them, sorry, and resolve issues around your client's credibility and trustworthiness. Just ignoring them, it's not smart. You need to tackle them. Even if you go around it, you need to tackle them. Don't uh, put things under the rug. The last thing is about BERT and EAT. You don't have a magic, you don't have score, you don't have all those uh, uh, page ranks. For me, you just need to think of ways to create quality content and to evaluate your low quality content and decide whether you make it better or you kill it. Now, I want to talk a bit about blog strategy and then about why less can be much, much, much more. A uh, blog is something that's really close to my heart and I'm a huge believer in it. Uh, it fascinates me. Um, I just uh, heard the Lily Ray presentation in the SMX West in San Diego um, last month, I think, last week, last month. I don't remember when I heard it. But basically she said that we need to stop producing content for the sake of producing content. For many people, it will probably stating the obvious. But for so many companies that I see and I monitor closely, they are really failing this field. In a nutshell, how do I see things? I think that you don't need to chase production. You need to focus on depth. You need to prioritize quality. Users need your content to be useful. Really, really, who cares if you publish free posts each week, if you can't bring value, if you can't bring traffic? In the end of the day, I really think that if you care about organic traffic, nothing beats evergreen content. It's really easy for me to say, but you need to, to do all the efforts and strives. Now, there's a term called the library approach. I think I saw it in the Animals blog. The Animals, blo Animals are a great content marketing agency. Um, and I really like the way they defined it, the library approach. They said that if your blog relies on organic traffic, treat it as a library an evergreen catalog of easy to access information. It's much more valuable than a feed of random blog posts. So I really think that you don't need to be afraid to repeat topics. You just need to tackle them from a different perspective, be creative. It's continuing to a conversation before about topic clusters. For example, if I write about logos, I will want to do a tutorial of how to create a logo, but I will also tackle a topic of uh, the importance of branding. I will tell the story of the most successful logos. Uh, a tip that really makes me stay on top of things is to make sure those crucial topics appear frequently in our editorial calendar so they won't be neglected. Now, an article that really stayed with me is something that I read a while ago on Adriff's blog. Um, it's a fascinating blog post that Ajos basically are saying that in 2018, they deleted 32% of their blog post and they saw an uplift of 8% in traffic. And it's not only them, also Siege Media, another famous content marketing agency, they wrote that they saw a traffic increase of almost 50% for one of their clients after cutting 15% of their content from the blog. Those numbers are nuts. And I think that now uh, with all the corona madness, this is a great time for you and for your team to start the spring cleaning early this year. So if you decide to do it, how to do it? Uh, it's quite simple. Uh, basically, low quality pages on a site affect the site overall authority. Again, authority, it's really important. You need to improve them or delete them. It's that simple. How do you decide? If there's no traffic or referring domains, it's simple. You just delete them, no harm done. If there are links, there are referring domains uh, for the post, to the post. So just redirect them to a better page and you squeeze everything from the link to. Another thing that you should consider is to merge relevant content from your low quality post to your high quality ones. Consolidation can be really fun and you feel like you're recycling, you feel that the work that you that you put in, it's not for nothing and you still get something out of it. It can be fun, a fun project. Another thing that is really important that after you do it, after you do this content audit, some people call it content pruning, 
you need to make sure that you don't link to one of your deleted or redirecting posts. Uh, so I really recommend you to run a screaming frog and update all the links. This is uh, very important. Now, you can talk about blog without repeating uh, those three words again. When you do a blog, you need to think all the time how you become an expert, how you build an authority, and how you gain trust. Something that uh, really, really bugs me is that people are really afraid to link externally. They don't like it. They don't do it. And for me, you need to reference quality sources. It's it's really, if you will reference quality sources, it's part of the winning recipe. It helps EAT, it builds trust, it makes your page stronger. And the fact that people don't see it that way always fascinates me. Why keeping everything inside? Don't be North Korea, share. Now, I'm not saying that link juice is, is, is a myth. It's not a myth, but in my opinion, it contradicts quality. You know, Link internally wherever is relevant. Relevant is the key. As long as your content is great, don't worry. Again, I'm not telling you to link to the same page a lot of times because it's relevant, because then it's really diluting, but don't be afraid from a, a relevant internal linking. This is really important. Another thing is auto pages. Auto pages are a great way to signal search engines why you should be trusted. In the August 18 medical update, everyone talking about talked about it. Is uh, we saw the importance of quality writers and the real experts in the field. It matters. So I really uh, strongly recommend uh, to create authors pages that will help you build your writer's reputation. In the end, they are the engine of your blog. The last thing that I'm going to tackle here is the UGC content, user-generated content. For me, I think it's a really tricky topic, but I'll say that you need to stay in control. If you cannot moderate comments, just get rid of them. Spammy, unrelated comments can develop into a big pain. If it's just like people linking to the to the website, if it's not related, if it becomes a live Atletico Madrid versus Barcelona, uh, you really need uh, to take care of your uh, UGC content. Now, I'm from Israel, and here in Israel, people are joking about cleaners and babysitters being a valuable resource. Everyone are afraid here to share them because of the fear of losing them. And for me, it's kind of the same with writers. When you find a quality writer that really gets it, he gets it from the research phase to the structure and the execution, that this writer is, is, is more than a writer. He's, he's also a content marketeer. You need to hold into him. Good writers are a rare resource, and I think this is something that uh, it's really important to understand. And I'm going to run real fast because those things for me are really obvious. You need to take care of grammar. You need to take punctuation. A lot of content that is written by non-native speakers, it's, it's, it's seen. It's very seen. A bad post structure. You need to create great topics and hierarchy. Repetitiveness, don't repeat yourself. Overdo. So many writers that some of them are amazing, they just do they do overdo they just they shove their messages down the reader's throats and it's not natural and it's not good and the last thing is i said earlier to analyze your competition and understand what works but in many cases i see people rely too much on one specific source and i don't like to talk about 10x content because for me it's always a cliche but in the end of the day originality is important and you need to think how to make a much much better content now, the last topic that I'm going to cover today is about localization, not translation. I'm going to start again, going back to uh, my old friend Bert, that is multilingual. Uh, Dawn Anderson from Bertie, uh, she had a super interesting session also in the SMX San Diego. And in her talk, she showed a lot of uh, fascinating stuff. But for me, the thing that stayed is that, and, and I really uh, relate to that, is that the algorithm is still behind for non-English SERPs. It's very clear for me, and I see it in many cases. I saw it in June 19 with the diversity update. I saw it when Google announced that BERT exp uh, is expanding in December. Uh, for me, it was still very far from the English SERP level. And that's great, you know, because the opportunity in languages is amazing. Less quality content, less crowd, more potential for me. Um, you can see now that there are many other belts being built, a lot of uh, new NLP machines, and that means that conversational search can scale, and it's going to happen real soon. You have uh, Bert Brothers, you have Alberto, the Italian, you have Deepset, a German NLP machine, you have Camembert, the French NLP machine. Those things, basically, it's it makes human labeling almost redundant. 
and sentence prediction just gets better and better in languages. So what does it mean? What's my bottom line here? The big leap is just around the corner. I don't know if international SEO is part of your strategy or not, but if it is, I strongly recommend you to join the game because uh, it's going to be fascinating. Now, I want to talk a bit about us in Wix. Uh, I'm very lucky that we're working in 19 languages and I'm doing SEO in so many languages. Uh, it really teaches me a lot. Uh, in many of those uh, geos, we are market leaders. Um, and I want to say something about how we do localization here. Like the word that I really hate is translation. Uh, here we do localization. For example, uh, I will give you an example. When we research the topics that people care about in the US, we saw that there's a constant conversation around, around website builders versus hiring a web developer. But for example, this topic is a non-issue in Brazil. Nobody talks about it. So I won't waste a precious real estate on my homepage just because I saw it in the English page. So what, what did I do? I conducted research, I checked my support articles, my competitors, my volumes, and I talked about topics that are much more relevant for these market audiences. For example, in Brazil, they care about 24-7 support. Now, I think that in the end, the reason that uh, we are good in what we're doing is because it all starts with knowing your users. It starts with talking with your clients' clients. It's with uh, us dealing with product and really doing usability tests, and we care. We really care about our users. We're conducting interviews, and we really get the feel of where our audience is, in which, in which phase is he in. So another thing that I want to say is that we need to remember that not all the SERPs are the same. Intent and SERP change from geo to geo and they behave differently. And this is why you really need to invest in the SERPs research. This is crucial for your success. Some Something like some very small tidbits that I want to share with you are like some funny insights from our uh, different geos. For example, in German, there are no how-to keywords. They are, there are some uh, keywords, but they are so small. Most volumes are hiding in the big keywords in German, which are the transactional and informative. They are together in German. German people just know how to do things, apparently. In the Japanese market, uh, for example, testimonials works amazing. The Japanese people expect to see case studies and social proof. This is a key for success in this market. In the Spanish uh, market, we have a very unique situation that we use a subdomain. We don't use country TLDs. And what we need to do because of that, we need to be very sensitive because we have so many users from all over the Latin America and Spain. And we need to dance between those different dialects between the Latin American audiences and the Spain audiences. Uh, another small thing is about outreach that it's, it's, it's always so funny that in France, for example, it's just much, much harder. The French people are really not making our life easy. Another uh, uh, interesting example that we saw here was when try, we tried to create a wedding page and we discovered that Brazilian weddings are just different. They don't have registry apps like they have in the, they are very common in the US. Uh, basically in Brazil, the happy couple creates an online store where they sell the gift that they want. Like if they want to get a microwave, a microwave for their wedding, they just open a store, they add a microwave and someone buys it. Um, it's just like it, it, it made our work so different. We need to adjust the product. We need to think differently. And this is how we do things here. And again, it's about localization. Now, we're about to end and I want to do like a very, very short recap of what we talked about. Again, I think that we need to manage client expectations by educating them about talking about the complexity of the machine, but still show them that we know their business goals. I think that mixed SERPs are here to stay and you need to plan accordingly and be smart about it. I think that intent, context and relevance are the glue that connect between keyword and topics and you need to research those heavily. I think uh, like, the, like the legendary Will Reynolds say, you need to give the people what they want. You need to think about answers, not about funnels all the time. I think that uh, BERT and EAT, the lesson that he taught, taught us is that Google is evolving all the time and so should us. About blog, you don't need to chase production in your blog, focus on depth, focus on evergreen content that can really stay for years. And the last thing is about not translating and localizing. Uh, now I remember that I said another important thing, use SERP ints. 
really try to understand what lessons can you get from the SELP. Now, um, just before we end, and because I'm still a company man, I want to say a few words about a topic that really bothers me personally, Wix SEO perception. Wow, <laughs> the things that I've read along the years, I just want to use the stage to say that uh, the Wix SEO solution for professionals is really great. And we really go toe to toe with any platform, in my opinion. My team, for example, is winning in so many difficult keyword environments and I'm using only the Wix product. I'm really certain that you can take on any client project with the Wix platform. Uh, I'm working here for five years and we changed so much in the past five years that I'm here. The changes in the SEO product are massive. And I know that we are not perfect, but we are working hard to be. And the product team here closed so many gaps with our marketing tools and solutions. And so many great things are just around the corner. Um, so what I'm trying to say that I really believe that the people who have misconceptions about Wix just didn't try us in the last couple of years. And I really encourage them to do it. I'm sure that they will become ambassador of us in no time. Um, for those who want to try, we have an amazing partners program for professional agencies, for freelancers, for web creators. Uh, it's called Wix Partners. I strongly recommend you to check it out. There's an amazing team over there that is just dedicated to your success. They, the only thing that they care about is that you will focus on scaling. So I, I really, really recommend you to give it a try. I, that's it. I hope you enjoyed this webinar. Now, uh, Lauren, I think that we can move to the Q&A with the time yeah. that we have left. Thank you. We don't have much time left, but that was an amazing amount of content um, <laughs> uh, packed into 55 minutes of time. So uh, just to let everyone know, we're going to be like writing all of this up in a big recap, uh, sharing the video, share, sharing the slide decks, et cetera, et cetera. Thanks again for that, Idan. It was it was fantastic. Uh, first question, um, is Camembert really the uh, official name of Bert in France? Or this is, is what I read. This is what I read. Okay. And again, I like to cross cross sources and I saw it in uh, in two or three articles. And yes, this is the NLP machine that's uh, going to supposed to crack the French language barrier. Okay, excellent. My favorite cheese and my mm -hmm. favorite uh, update. So um, I'm a brie guy. <laughs> so uh, here we go. Um, a lot of questions about people also ask. I'm going to drop some resources about the recent reduction in PAA here in the chat. But um, you had mentioned that at Wix you had uh, seen the reduction and people also ask in a handful of verticals. Uh, do you have the information? Would you uh, mind sharing that with our audience today so we can kind of go through that a little bit? The only thing that I can say about the people also ask that uh, it's, it happens to us in, in, in queries that are much more tools oriented, things that are like generators and makers and creators, things that they, they're really, uh, I, I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm right with my assumption, but things that you are really, you go into a tool and you generate something. It's not as complex as creating websites, for example. And this is the niche when we saw the people also ask drop. But again, I really think that it's way, way too early uh, to have conclusions about that. Speaking of uh, user intent and tools and best of or comparison oriented intent queries, do companies like G2 and Captera have an evergreen advantage over uh, tool sites or SaaS sites, or is there any way that they can compete? Any way the software companies can compete with the comparison engines? I think that uh, we have no choice to live together. I think that, uh, again, you know, it's marketing and we know the affiliate world and we have a lot of uh, thoughts about it. But in the end of the day, you know, when I'm interviewing people and I ask them where did they consume the knowledge about Wix, they tell me that they read it in X or Y or Z website and all of them are affiliates. And in the end of the day, they're creating good content. And I think that if they create good content, they will stay in the game and we will need to find where we can shine, where there are, like I said, we need to find where are the queries that are solely products and to be there. But again, we will need to be part of those four or five or six uh, product results that will uh, stay against them. Great. I have a number of questions about pruning um, old content, outdated content, or just duplicate content. By duplicate, I mean like uh, blog posts of the same topic, right? So uh, I have a lot of questions like, are you sure it really helps? 
Um, the uh, examples that you shared from Ahrefs and from Siege, along, amongst other sites, were great. I'd like to uh, add that at a Search Engine Journal, we continuously consolidate and prune content and rewrite ever uh, rewrite content. So it's it's evergreen and it's updated. It's an ongoing and highly successful part of our SEO strategy. So if if you do have a blog, I would say that's older than two years, three years, this is something that you definitely want to look into, especially especially if it's a field that changes over time, right? So if it's something like if you have a mathematics blog, maybe the concept of math hasn't changed over the past three years, 100 years, whatever. But if it's something like if it's a tech-oriented site or uh, services or an SEO-oriented site, Something like that. I mean, that is that is something that we have a we have a team that does that internally right now, and and it's it's shown great results over the past two year period. So I we'll we'll drop some um we'll drop some guides, and if there's anything that you have Edan, that um helps to back that up with anything that you've worked on, um I think that would be a great guide for some of the questions that we had on that topic, um that have come in. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, no, I think that I talked a lot and I need to, to drink uh, a glass of water, but I really enjoyed it and it was it was very nice uh, to talk with you, Lauren. Okay, great, great. So uh, that's it for now. We're a little bit over time. Just to let everyone know, we're going to be sending over your questions to Idan and the team at Wix to go ahead and answer them. We'll be sending those answers as well in the follow-up update uh, along, like I said, with the video the slide deck, and uh, we're going to be um, we're going to be transcribing and writing up a wrap up post. Uh, so um, we'll have all of it in, of that information uh, together for you. And of course, Idan, I'm gonna give you a chance to rehydrate after that 55 minutes of dropping gold. <laughs> Thank you so much <laughs> uh, to you Go and around. the Wix team. Yes. Are you still there? Yes, yes, I'm here. Mm. I was saying thank you for you uh, to you and the Wix team. Thank you uh, for you to you especially for staying up um, so late um, and uh, being able to make this uh, 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 event here in the U.S. Um, after we're finished with the webinar, we're going to be having a short survey. If uh, everyone could take the time to fill that out, it'll help us make our presentations better in the future, and it's always great. Um, to get feedback. So thanks again, Idan. Anything you'd like to say before signing off? Just stay safe with this coronavirus around. <laughs> and buy toilet Ooh. paper. Apparently, <laughs> it's, it's a thing. <laughs> but wait until I buy it first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks again for attending our uh, Search Engine Journal webinar, and we'll be following up with all of you. Have a great day.